Well, here we are for another gig story. Hi, Jim Flies too. And I've got a neat story for you. It takes me back to 1985 and the artist Stevie Ray Vaughan. Who I happen to get a chance to meet and hang with. Him and his whole band. And in fact, played a show with them. I wasn't playing with Stevie. I'm playing with a band that opened the show for him. I got all the details coming up. You're going to love this one. Gig Stories! So back in my college days, I was um, 21 years old. And I was uh, in college at the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire. 1985 was a very, very busy year for me, playing in the top college jazz ensemble, playing in concert band, playing in percussion ensemble, and doing gigs also outside of school with about four or five different groups as a regular performer with them. And um, one of the groups that I played with was, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it very well, was a group called JD and the Back Alley Mad Men. That's a pint glass, if you didn't notice. I joined the group in about May of 1985 to replace their exiting drummer, and uh, we went into the studio and recorded a three-song demo and uh, got real busy that summer. We were playing regularly at this place in Eau Claire on Water Street called the Pioneer Tavern. Eight-piece R&B horn band. Three horns, drums, bass, keyboards, front man playing guitar also and singing and another guitar player, our main lead guitars. Talk about crowding. That was a cozy little space and me with my little Ringo kit, my 66 Ludwig's Silver Sparkle at the time, um, were crammed onto that stage and we would usually play, play 9 till 1 a.m. Guaranteed to ruin your Thursday. Our lead guitarist, Scotty, came into the rehearsal. We practiced at a house that two or three of the guys shared. And um, he came to the rehearsal and he said, Well, gentlemen, how would you like to open a concert for Stevie Ray Vaughan, playing for Stevie Ray Vaughan? And we're like, half of us go, Who's he? And he's like, you don't know who Stevie Ray Vaughan is? He was just written up in Rolling Stone magazine. He's like the up-and-coming guy. He's the new Jimi Hendrix. He's like going to be a blues legend. He's like blah, blah, blah. Well, Texas blood was out. And that had gotten some traction for Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble. But um, we, uh, we hadn't heard of him, you know. But anyway, he said, how would you like to do that? And we're like, yeah, of course, you know, we're, we're in. He goes, well... We just have to confirm, he worked, our guitar player, who is also at the university, worked for the University Activities Commission. And so he was in on a lot of their planning, and he happened to be in the office that one day, and they said, we're going to have Stevie Ray Vaughan play, you know? And he's like, wait, 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 what, when? Well, it's going to be in December. He's like, my band can open for him. So they're like, great, you know, let's work it out. So who was Stevie Ray Vaughan and started checking out the record stores and started looking at the magazines, you know, the guitar player magazines and and uh, all that stuff and started getting pretty jacked about this because it's like, well, <laughs> this is going to be a pretty major cool thing. So anyway, the Zorn Arena at University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, UWEC, home of the Blue Golds. Uh, was going to be the place of the concert. And I think the capacity of the arena is 2,200 or 2,500 or something like that. And I think I looked it up and I see that the concert attendance was only like 751. I remember it being a lot bigger than that, so I don't know where they get the information on the Soul to Soul tour in the itinerary, but it's in there. You can look it up online and you can see all the different places that they played. Um... But anyway, that's what it was. December 11th, a Wednesday, 1985, was going to be the day of the concert. So we had prepped and we got ready and we were going to play our set, which was probably like a half an hour 
or maybe even as much as 40 minutes. And, um, you know, we were pretty excited about this whole thing. But we got in on a little bit of the inside secret. Because our guitar player, working for the University Activity Commission, got to see things like the contract. <laughs> and he got to see things like the rider to the contract. And so he would come back with juicy tidbits. He goes, yeah, you wouldn't believe what Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble are asking for for the concert. It's like, well, what, what, what? You know, it's like, you know, the, I, I don't remember what the amount of money was, you know, $7,500, $8,000, something like that. But here, check this out, you know, and he'd be like, two cases of, you know, whatever beer it was. Literally, I'm not joking, on even days, a, body, a bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label, and then on odd days, a bottle of Jim Beam Bourbon. You know, you know drinking or using something. And uh, it got to the point where finally... I knew for a, I knew for quite a while that I could, that I had a problem with things. Provided with quality food, no fast food. No fast food will be allowed nor, nor tolerated. It must be home cooked meals or privately catered in. Um, be available to the band, you know, and the crew during setup times. Fruit plates, all the stuff that you would typically see in a uh, in a rider. But it's specifically no fast food. So in other words, no bunch of pizzas from Pizza Hut or Pizza Pit or Domino's. It had to be like catered in and the university actually took care of that. The catering department that did all the the, the meals for the student body. You know, they, they had, you know, they had hot beefs and, and nice casseroles and all that stuff were set up. Um, but it had the alcohol requirement. <laughs> and, you know, the university activity said, I don't know where he thinks he's playing. But this is a college. This isn't some kind of a blah, 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 blah. And they just crossed out all this stuff with the two cases of beer and the, the bottles of alcohol every other day, you know, uh, whatever it was. And it's like, they can get drunk on their own money. They're not going to do it on our dollar. <laughs> Something like that. So they just crossed that out and then they returned the contract. And ultimately, you know, they, they came in. And, anyway, oh, yeah, one was like a case of Coca-Cola. So like a case of Coca-Cola, a case of beer and uh, the bottles of uh, whiskey and bourbon. Well, like I had mentioned, I was playing a lot during that time. <clears throat> and the night before, on a Tuesday night, I was playing uh, at a jazz lounge called the Civic Center Inn. But it was kind of the place where if somebody was gonna come to town, that's where they were gonna stay because it was considered the nicer hotel, a little bit, uh, a little bit more posh than maybe the Holiday Inn or some of the other places that existed. So, that's where they all stayed, and it was like, whatever, eight or nine stories, maybe ten stories tall. And um, and so uh, I was playing there in the lounge, and of course I knew I was going to be doing the gig the next night. So, you know, we're playing our typical jazz tunes and listening to, uh, you know, the glasses clink and a, a typical Tuesday night, not very many people around, a few traveling salesmen. But I noticed in the lobby, which you could see right from the stage, it was just down this little ramp out there to the lobby area where there was the check-in. Um, I saw these, these guys that looked a little bit more rough, and they were kind of walking around. And I saw this one guy with, with glasses and kind of curly hair. And I was like, hmm, yeah, I don't know who that is. And I remember a couple of guys were in the bar area drinking, and um, I didn't think anything of it. None of these guys were Stevie Ray, but there's a couple guys that was like, I wonder who that is. You know, that, oh, that guy is not a typical salesman looking guy, and that's not the typical clientele that we see in here. So anyway, I played that, that, that gig that night. And then the next day, um, most of us, if we uh, had any classes going on, we kind of uh, blew them off a little bit. I um, went down to the arena where a lot of the other guys from our band were going to be and said yeah let's you know let's meet down there at like noon you know because you know we'll get our stuff in and then we can set up and everything we all wanted to be there we're all pumped and all, all all charged up about doing this so we all wandered over there and we're like you know looking around and claire brothers audio from harrisburg pennsylvania at the time anyway 
uh, were the folks that were doing the tour, or they were at least doing this leg of the tour, and they were doing all the audio, sound, and lights. And we kind of volunteered our services. And so there was this guy, this big guy named Bob. And he was like the stage manager, probably the tour manager of some sort. I don't, probably not the tour manager, probably just the stage manager and equipment, equipment guy. He was the monitor guy. Big guy, you know, he had this black t-shirt that said Tina on it. Tina Turner. She was really big in 1985 and he probably worked one of her tours and ran audio or something. I don't know. So <laughs> Big Bob was like, okay. So we got guys here, you're in this band, okay, you know, we got other people and your friends, all right. So if you want to help, you can help. And he was really like intense. If you want to help, you can help, but you got to listen up and we'll tell you what you need to do and just follow directions and we'll be fine, okay? It's like, okay, so we need to get that equipment in that truck loaded down the skid in here to the arena you know, and we'll, uh, it's got to come up onto the stage. We'll have other people, you know, directing where it goes, all that, yada, yada, yada. So we're like, oh, okay, you know, you know, we're like lots of young, eager, eager beavers, you know, and we we're like 21, 22, most of us. And Stevie Ray was 31 at the time. One of the guys, I got to back up. One of the guys I noticed at that club where I'd been playing the night before was uh, a guy with blonde hair and it was kind of long hair. And, uh, you know, he was drinking with a few other guys, I, I presume from the road crew. But I noticed that this, this particular guy had a, um, a left hand that his, his hand was, was deformed. It wasn't formed properly. I, I think it was shorter and, and he had only a couple digits, something like that. And I just happened to see that. Not something you see every day and I just happened to see him. Well, when we got to do the setup and the gig and everything, I, I see this guy and I'm like, oh, hey, that was the dude that was at the the club the night before, you know, at the jazz club, uh, having drinks. And I'm like, hmm, okay, you know, I'll just filed that back in my mind. So we start helping set up. This is a long story, so you got to stay tuned because there's a lot of details and parts to it. But it was really fun. We get there and uh, um, we're unloading all this stuff. And a bunch of newbies, you know, we don't really know what we're doing. So somebody's helping with this rack of power amplifiers and rack mounted gear. And it was in an anvil flight case, you know, with coasters or, um, yeah, with casters. Not coasters, casters. Coasters is something you put a JD mug on. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it comes to the, the back of the truck. To the ramp, of course, there's a little uneven <laughs> split on that ramp, and somebody's pushing, and it hits that, and it goes, whoo, bam, <laughs> and it was like slow motion. I wasn't pushing it, but I was there, and I saw Big Bob Tina come out, and he's, and they see this wham, all these power amps and stuff inside, and he goes. Son of a... Oh, man, he, he just lost his... He lost his cookies. He was really pissed. And he's like, You guys got to start listening. I need somebody to help out. And you got to be watching what you're doing. My God, my. He was really angry. So we're like, Wow. You know, just, yeah, what'd you do that for, buddy? You know, that kind of thing. They got... We got all the equipment in. And, uh, you know, the day wore on. And they were setting up all the gear... The staging was already prepared, you know, and put in there. When they would have concerts, uh, they would set up a, a stage. And incidentally, that's where I fought, uh, first saw Buddy Rich in that very same arena when I was 12 years old. So, yeah, 10 years later, I'm getting to load in myself. And So we continue to, uh, to set up uh, the stage and we get all our gear. And, you know, we're not sure when we can go, at what point we can load onto the stage what point we can sound check or any of that kind of stuff. So we're just kind of hanging out backstage. Well, they had, you know, Chris Whipper, Layton's drum kit, his Tama, uh, that fade kit. It was like an orange and yellow kind of fade together, or red and orange fade. It was really pretty. 
that nice Tama kit. And he had a couple of Timbales on the left over the hi-hat, or at least one. There was one, because I've got something special. Uh, I'll prove it. Um, I think he had two, though. I, I, I'm sure he had two. I, you know, it's weird, because it's not really a Timbali band, but he had them. Um, and then he had his uh, Sabian cymbals and his Tama drums. And um, as I recall, that night he was using two mounted and two floor. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was two up and two down. It might have been one mounted. I, I, it's, but he had his ride cymbal up pretty high. So I'm sure there was two toms up there. Otherwise, it probably would have been down lower. Anyway, so they got all their, their gear over there and everything. And I'm like, oh, that, that's, that's really cool. And we're like eyeballing everything. And they're, we're eyeballing all the other equipment. And then Stevie had uh, two Fender amplifiers. And he was using, I specifically remember this, he was using Fender Vibroverb amplifiers that had been hot rodded. Now, I don't know what the Vibroverbs uh, originally, um, you know, were rated at, I think, 35 watts or 40, something like that. But uh, he'd, he'd have them hot rodded and... and and as, as the story went, I think it was some guy in Georgia did the hot rodding on all those mods and everything. And so, you know, they got to do their, uh, their setup. So there were the vibroverbs and all the monitors and the Tama drum set. Tommy Shannon's rig. This is good. I can't remember if he was playing a Fender jazz bass or a P bass, but it was the one that was kind of like that tobacco burst look, um, might have been a sunburst, it, but anyway, it, you can look in the 1980, mid-80s, he was pl always playing that bass. I think it was a P bass, but anyway, he had two PV Max bass heads and cabinets. Now, what is PV Max? Well, of course, everybody knows that back in the day, Acoustic 360... With the 361 cabinet was the amp to have, like Led Zeppelin, John Paul Jones, or uh, Ampeg SVT. Those were like the kings, you know, the 8, 10-inch speakers. Well, the PV Max was like an 800-watt head. I think it was solid state. I don't think it was tube. Um, the 800-watt heads, I think they were bi amp heads, so like 400 for the, the big drivers, like the woofers, and and 400 for the mids and uppers. It had two 10s and two 18s, and I think it was an 18 on top and bottom and the two 10s in the middle. And I think there, I don't know if there was a horn in there, but he had two of those. So he had this monster bass rig. And um, so we had all our gear set up off side of the stage. And at one point, you know, I've got my Ludwig Silver Sparkles set up over off stage waiting to get the nod so we could put our stuff on stage and get set up and get our mics in place and and get sound checked and all that stuff. Well, we had all our gear just off the stage, like I said, and Kenny, our bass player, had his, his Ampeg. It wasn't an SVT. I think it was a B215 or something. But it, he had a large cabinet, but the head itself was, was not... It was the little brother to the SVT. It was still a beast, but it, it wasn't that Portaflex. It was, it was a little bit bigger. I think it was a B215 or something. Uh, anyway, um, so he had that. And, um, like, so... Oh, and they had the B3 player because uh, Reese Winans was the B3 player, who incidentally was the guy that was walking around in the lobby the night before when I was playing that jazz gig. And he kind of walk with his hands in his pockets and he kind of comes in and he's looking at you know what was going on in the jazz room you know it's a typical jazz quartet you know he's looking not too interested and walks off and he walks around you know nothing to do kind of whatever anyway so Reese's um, B3 was over on the other side of the stage all our gear is there so here's Tommy Shannon and Chris Layton hanging out and, and and Chris Whipper, he, he says to me, he's like looking at my Ludwigs, you know, and I kind of go over there and I say, hey, man, how you doing? He goes, man, are, are these your drums? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, oh, man, I used to have a kit just like this. 
back in the 1960s Ludwig. It was in blue sparkle. Man, I wish I still had that kid. Those are really beautiful drums. There's nothing like them, man. I love those drums. You know, I was like, oh, thanks, man. You know, super nice guy. I mean, those guys didn't have to give us the time of day, but they did. And Tommy, he's looking at, you know, our, uh, you know, he's just looking at gear too. And he's, you know, kind of curious. He's like, he's like talking to Kenny, our bass player. And he's like, oh man, I wish I, I, I wish I, I used to have a, a beautiful uh, Ampeg, you know, I still got it, but we don't use them on this. You know, we got this PV endorsements. So we got to play that. It's no good, but, you know, we get paid for it. So, <laughs> he was like dogging PV. And um, he was going all on about Kenny's Ampeg. So we're like feeling pretty good of like, wow, these guys are giving us the time of day talking to us. This is pretty cool. We finally get a chance to get set up on stage. And now it gets, now we get intense. All right. So Bob, Big Bob, Tina, right? He's on the microphone and he's got two monitor wedges for Stevie Ray. And he's like, check, one, check, check. Putting his hands around the mic, trying to get these to feed back. And he's, you know, and they're feeding these things with like a couple of hundred watt power amps or something. They had crown power amps back, you know, behind the mains. And so you have these crown hundred watt stacks of amps and I think they had some phase linears back there too as I recall so they had phase linear 100s and they had crown 100s and they were using those to power all this stuff and he's trying to get those to feedback shack one one and he would cover it and if it would feed back a little bit he'd move that monitor wedge a little bit check one check one one hey hey you know doing this and covering the mic and all that and, you know, he gets it set to where he thinks it is, you know, where it's good. And mind you, you know, Stevie Ray and those guys, they haven't sound, uh, you know, they haven't run anything yet. Our, our gear on and in place. And it was tight. Layton's drum riser was right there. My drum kit was set up right in front of it. Okay. And so we're getting our drums, my drums in place and everything. And two dynamic things happen in fairly short succession. We get the drums, or we're getting the drums set up, and the drum tech, the guy with the withered hand, long blonde hair, is the drum tech. And he's going around, and he's taking off all the heads, the batter heads, on the timbales and the tom-toms and snare drum. And he's got brand new boxes of Remo uh ambassador coated heads and i'm like oh man i couldn't afford a heads back in the day i was barely able to scrape enough money to replace my snare head every once in a while so you know i'd get i got a set of pinstripes once from a friend and those are really cool and i played them for a long time this was no change in drum heads every th every year this was this was changing drum heads every three years or, or longer i mean i kept heads on forever so I, i'm seeing take off these heads which are like in my opinion barely used and so i said um are you just going to toss those heads man and he goes he goes yeah i'll just throw them away he was a british guy and he's got this drum key and he's like he'd be like dum, dum, dum. Boom, 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 tapping around on it. And then he put, put the key in his mouth, <clears throat> tighten it up some more, pushing on it. And he's like, um, yeah, if you want them, you could have them all that can. I'm like, okay, man, thanks. You know, so I like squirrel those and got those heads and I, I put them right behind me where my drums were, um, but leaning up against Chris Layton's drum riser. Not against his drums, but against the riser. Big mistake. Because he comes around and he's going to tap tune the front bass drum head, which he didn't change, but he was just going to go around and check the tuning. And he comes around there and he's like, Take these heads off me. 
It was just about that dynamic. Get these heads the hell out of here. If you want those heads, you can have them. But get them the half out of my way. And I was like, are you kidding me? I'm like, oh, man, I'm sorry, dude. You know, he was just get them out of the way. So I grabbed the heads and I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, this dude's a hothead, you know. And I was like sweating bullets. And I noticed he had a little satchel, not a satchel, um, like a... Um, you know, like a little gym bag, one of those little duffel bags, uh, like cloth. And he had, you know, his testing sticks, some drum keys, things like that. And a bottle of Jack Daniels in that. And I'm like, I think somebody has a hangover. Um, but anyway, uh, that's, that's what his deal was. One of the heads I saved for posterity. <laughs> there it is, a 13-inch. Remo Ambassador. And it says here, given to me in December of 1985 by Stevie Ray Vaughan's drummer technician. An awfully crank cranky and foul mouth Brit. <laughs> Note the burn hole in the edge. Chris Layton used to lay his cigarette on this timbali. Uh, he complimented me on my old Silver Sparkle Ludwig kit when we... JD in the back alley, Madman opened a show for them. Uh, yeah, you can see that little burn mark. <laughs> yeah, he would like, you know, be smoking. He'd put a cigarette up there, and evidently it fell off the rim of the drum and onto here and burned a little hole. But that that came from his timbali over that. So uh, I don't know what I ever did with the other heads. Um, I had to have put them on drums and used them for a while. I just don't know. I can't I can't remember what I would have done with them. Um I probably have them on some drums right now and I just don't even remember that's what they were. So that was the deal. The next time dynamic thing that happened was the routine that Big Bob, Tina Bob, had just done all the monitors. When it came time for us to pull our gear into place, I had my drums pulled into place, and it was really tight. It was a pretty tight stage. Because uh, you had the monitor, sidewash monitors over there. You had the B3, you had the bass rig. You had, it wasn't like a monster stage. I mean, it was as wide as a basketball court, but maybe not quite, you know? So our singer... He's like, wow, it's really crowded, you know. And so he grabs the monitors and he pushes them out. He pushes them away from the mic stand so that he could do his thing up there. And, and uh, we see Bob, you know, hustling around doing stuff. And all of a sudden he, he stops and he's like, I want to see who moved those monitors. And I want to see them right now. And, and Paul being very like what what man he, he's like he's like oh, what man it, it was me what, what's the problem? don't f with my monitors <laughs> and he gets them puts them back in place back in place goes over pulls them up one check check one <laughs> and he went through the whole routine again for like 10 minutes trying to get those monitors loud and he's like don't mess with it. If you guys want to play this show, just stop messing with stuff. And it wasn't messing with. It was like, I mean, those guys were heavy F-bomb. Heavy F-bombs. We were like all rattled and everything. And So we got to sound check our stuff. Like I said, Claire Brothers Audio was doing the sound. I remember they had a, um, they had a studio board that they had modified for going out on the road. I, I can't tell you much more about it than that. All I know is that we were all talking gear, you know, and our we had our sound guy who was going to run sound for us. And they said, there's the board, go ahead, you know. And um, he's like, okay, you know. He uh, he ran uh, he ran our sound, and then there would be there was some guy just kind of watching over his shoulder so he didn't, you know, like mess up something else on the board. So we, we did our sound check, and then, as I recall, we had to pull our stuff off stage so Stevie Ray could come up and do his sound check, 
and uh, all those guys do there. And, uh, you know, they, they ran through a couple of things and, you know, got it, got it together. And we took off and, we, of course, we get set up, you know, before the show and get our gear back in to position and mic'd up and everything. And uh, we come out on stage and I think we started with the old, uh, was that a Sam and Dave tune? Flip, flop, fly. Flip, flip. So we finished that tune, <laughs> and, and uh, we had a pretty good following locally, somewhat regionally, and you know the towns around the area. But um, somebody yells out, "It's too loud!" <laughs> <laughs> and you know we had three horns you know everything was mic'd up and it was like we came out there and just hit and um and uh, the guy that was standing next to mark on the soundboard he, he heard that and he goes wait till stevie ray comes out <laughs> so i don't even, i don't know if they even had the subs on for us you know the subwoofers they may have they may not have i don't know but then you know we played our set and we always closed uh, our gigs with uh, a tune the Blues Brothers did, Going Back to Miami. And, and when we, whenever we do Miami, I always had a drum feature, a drum solo. And uh, so that was kind of a cool thing. But uh, so the concert starts, we do our, our thing, we leave, get off stage, you know, and then we get to just kind of like hang loose and, and talk to, to whomever. And we had our locker room on the one side of the gym, Stevie Ray and his band had like the visitor's locker, locker room or the home team's locker room, whatever, an office, uh, athletic office over on the other side. And that was their green room. So, you know, we, um, interestingly, I didn't stay and, and watch the entire Stevie Ray set. I was kind of in and out. I was kind of like, this is pretty cool. Um, but to be honest with you, that place was such a barn. It was kind of really muddy sounding. The sound was not great. It was really loud. I remember he played Texas, uh, you know, that, uh, Texas Flood. He played uh, Voodoo Child, Mary Had a Little Lamb, uh, Soul to Soul. I got an interesting little thing about that. He played, um, Voodoo, did I say Voodoo Child? Um, he did, uh, you know, all the stuff that he kind of was made him famous. And, and that was a, a pretty prolific time, I think, for the band. So um, I was a little bit in and out of the, the, the concert, and it was pretty loud. Um, it wasn't unbelievably loud, but it was, it was loud, but it was, it was just a boomy. The Thompson Twins, remember the Thompson Twins? They played in that arena. They didn't have a lot of shows that, you know, were featured that played that arena, but there were some. And I remember uh, Thompson Twins played there also that year. So, you know, we listened to the concert and the encores and everything, and it was a great show. And, and it was like, yeah, man, you know, you guys, I don't know who told us this. I don't remember, but they're like, you can go and hang out and meet Stevie, you know, after the show. So it's probably his tour manager. So we're like, that's really cool. And Tommy Shannon was a really humble, nice guy. He was just a sweet dude. And Chris Layton, you know, he was he was a very very kind guy. They were into their thing, but you know they, you know, and Reese was kind of to himself, the keyboard player. Um, and so anyway, we got, we got to go to the meet and greet room. So they had like this meet and greet room, which was just off of their dressing room. And so they had this case of Cokes sitting there. It's like, hey, man, Coke. No, no, that's not for you. That's for the band. And so those guys got off stage and we were already in that meet and greet room. And, and Chris and Tommy and Reese, they all came through and grabbed a Coke bottle, and they went into their room, which is where probably the beer and everything was, 
and uh, the bourbon, and and we were just out in this other room, and Stevie Ray was there, and he was sitting in just a, a regular old like folding chair, right in the middle of the room, and our band, our entourage of eight, was was all kind of hanging out, and said, yeah, man, you know it's a great show. He's like, oh man, thanks, man. He said, if I would have known you guys were a horn band, I would have had you come up, you know, we'd do soul to soul together. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that, man. That would have been great. You know, we're, oh, yeah, that would have been cool. You know, it's probably just saying it to be nice. He was a real gentleman, really humble guy. He seemed to be really shy, kind of talked like this, you know. And he's like, oh, a little bit shy. You know, he wasn't really, you know, flamboyant or anything. But there was a couple there, and they, they, these were like, I don't know. I'd kind of describe them as traveling groupies. I would guess they were 35, closing in on 40 years old. Maybe not quite that. But they were like, uh, they were talking to him like they knew him. And maybe they did, but they were just those kind of people that were like, you know, oh, hey, man, Stevie, yeah, you sounded really great tonight. Oh, yeah, good to see you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, oh, well, thanks, you know. And, and they were like, well, how, so how's Jimmy doing? How's Jimmy? And Stevie's like, oh, man, yeah, Jimmy, he's playing his ass off. Jimmy Vaughn, you know, and, and he's like, yeah, yo, oh, yeah, well, we saw Jimmy, you know, we saw him up at Duluth or whatever, you know. He's oh, yeah, yeah, he's playing, you know, the Thunderbirds, they're doing their thing. And the Thunderbirds, fabulous Thunderbirds, did open for Stevie Ray on that tour on a, on a number of shows earlier on. So they were having their heyday, too. Um, but, you know, we just, you know, we just listened mostly. I've never been an autograph hound, so I didn't get any autographs. There was a camera there. Our bass player brought his camera, took a bunch of photos. We did a reunion gig 12 years ago. No, 10 years ago, we did a reunion gig down at the Pioneer Tavern. And I asked Kenny, I said, man, you remember that? Oh, yeah. He says, I got a bunch of pictures. I got a bunch of pictures from that. It's some box somewhere in my house. I'm like, you're kidding. He's like, oh, no, yeah, I do. I'm, and he's he was the kind of guy where he didn't really do email. He was kind of like... He played with Luther Allison, you know, years later. And um, he he was really a great keyboard player and bass player. So he had kind of gotten really into the blues scene. And he, he claimed that he had all kinds of, um, all kinds of uh, pictures from that show. And but he's like, yeah, I've got, I've got pictures, you know. And they took pictures of us on stage too with that camera. I'm like, you gotta send them, man. You saw Probably never going to see any photos from that. I was never an autograph hound, so I never carried like a pen and everything. But our guitar player came in, and he had actually our front man, who also played guitar and trumpet sometimes. He had this 1977, I think. It might have been a 79. I think it was a 77. Anyway, yellow Strat. Like a pale yellow. And so um, he brought it in, and he's like, he told us, he said, I'm going to have Stevie Ray sign my Strat, man. This is going to be great. We're like, oh, yeah, cool, Paul. And it's great. You know, and, and, and he, before we went in to do the meet and greet, he's like, yeah, I got, I got a marker, you know. Was it a Sharpie? No, it wasn't a Sharpie. Was it a black marker? No, no, it wasn't black. It was a blue El Marco <laughs> magic marker. That's all he could find. He couldn't find a Sharpie. He couldn't find anything in black. And we're like, Blue market. That's all you can find, Paul. <laughs> Come on, man. And he's like, "Well, it's what I could do." So he uh, he brought his guitar over to Stevie Ray, and he's like, "Hey, Stevie, man, I was I was wondering if you could sign my guitar." And, and Stevie looks at me. He, he kind of lit up. He's, "Oh yeah, let me see it." And he starts playing it. And he just he was like a kid, man. His face lit up, and he's like, "Oh," and he looks at it. Oh, man, it's a beautiful guitar, man, you know? It's like, yeah, that's really nice. He said, would you mind si signing it? And, and we're all, like, watching. And he's like, oh, man, yeah, I'd be honored to sign it. Sure, no problem. So he says, if you could just sign it right on the back, you know? He goes, yeah, I, I can do that. And he says, what's your name? And he says, Paul. He's like, okay. And he's like, Paul, always play her with love. Stevie Ray Vaughan. And, <laughs> and, uh. That was that was it. Well, the next week, Paul had brought his guitar to the rehearsal, and he'd sprayed over that to keep it protected, right? So 
Paul had taken and masked off the guitar around the autograph and just went and sprayed it and then pulled the tape off. And so it had all these tape lines. It was a really bad job instead of just like clear coating the entire back, you know, and, and letting it, you know, feather out into the rest of the finish. He just taped it. And so it was like this jagged tape line. He says, yeah, I got, I, I let it dry, you know, a few days. And we saw it. It's like, yeah, it looks really nice. <laughs> but anyway, he had that autographed Stevie Ray guitar. And when we played, actually, I played some gigs with Paul in another band over in Milwaukee um, in the early 2000s. Um, did a few gigs. And um, I said, he was playing at that time a 335 Gibson. I said, Paul, do you still have this strap that Stevie Ray Vaughan, Vaughan signed? He goes, no, it got stolen off the bandstand at a gig in Milwaukee I was playing one time. I'm like, no. He goes, yeah, it's really bummer. So if anybody ever sees a yellow Strat or a pale yellow Strat, late 70s, with a blue El Marco, Stevie Ray Vaughan signature, Paul, always play her with love. You know where it goes. <laughs> you know where it's supposed to go. Anyway, he... Um, he never did find it. Stevie was a real gentleman, a really nice guy. Um, very humble, very quiet. You know, actually, all those guys were really cool. There was no flamboyant, like, yeah, man, you know, we're the boss. Everybody was super cool and super nice. I had moved to Madison, Wisconsin in 1990. And... Um, there was a Sunday night blues jam at a particular bar that I would go to sometimes. And um, I remember going to that one Sunday night and jamming and playing and got up the next morning and a friend of mine who took me to the jam and would go with me, he said, Hey man, did you hear about Stevie Ray? I'm like, well, what, what, what? He was playing Alpine Valley, which is like an hour away. He was playing Alpine Valley last night. Was killed in a helicopter crash. I'm like, you're kidding. I'm like, he's like, no man. I'm like, we were just playing at the Blues Jam last night, you know, and talking about Clapton and I think Buddy Guy was at that show, and and Stevie Ray and all these, and we're like, we're just like, I think Jeff was Jeff back at that. Might have been. Anyway, it was like such a tragedy. Jimmy Vaughn was at it. Such a tragedy that that happened. It just stunned us that just practically in our own backyard where this terrible helicopter crash was. Helicopter pilot going into instrument conditions, hit the ski hill, and that was it. Stevie died of internal bleeding. So, anyway, that's the Stevie Ray Vaughn story. He had gotten his life cleaned up toward the end. So I'm sure his riders didn't say two cases of beer and a bottle of Johnny Walker and a bottle of Jim Beam anymore. So that's good that he got his, his act together. And um, I hope you enjoyed the story of my encounter with Stevie Ray Vaughan and that fun time it was to open that one-off show. We'll have some more. Just stay tuned. Thanks a lot. I remember one night, I'll never forget this. This was about six months before we finally hit bottom. That's what we call it in the program of recovery. Uh, we both got down on our knees in this hotel room. We were praying, you know, please, God, help us stop this, you know, because we, we knew we were in some deep trouble. We knew that. But we couldn't stop. And we said this real deep prayer. We got up, went over there, did some more cocaine, drank some more booze. But the thing is, the prayer was answered. You know, it came six months later. And we both got clean and sober together. And it was like walking out of a cesspool out into the sunshine, you know, on a beautiful day.